Time to, in your uh, digital classroom over here, Google Classroom, I'm going to go to 5-2. Select that. Um, again, the fact that you're listening to me tells me you have completed number one up here. You're attending class. Uh, as it stands today, no one's in the classroom. No one's on campus, but I do have 22 of you online right now, and I will post this later to YouTube as well. Okay? Uh, make sure you fill out your attendance link. It's the same as this link right there. They're both one and the same. So you can click it from over here if you prefer. And then once you fill that out, open up uh, your lesson exam. So as we go through the lesson today, you can submit your answers. So make sure you get that in. Um, we will possibly, I know we'll use Desmos just to check our answers. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up the Desmos graphs right there. And I'm going to get just a blank one to start off the lesson. Um, actually, take that back. Instead of doing blank, I'm going to open up number 11. Graph number 11. The right triangle trigonometry. I'm going to have that one open. And that's just because on this graph, once it ever gets open, it'll have um, our ratios for trig. In case we need those today, I'll have that open on the left side of the screen. There they are, those ratios right there. All right, with that, I'm going to start on our bell ringer. So number one says, if cosecant equals three and cosine is less than zero, find cosine and tangent. And so by way of reminder, um, I want to, uh, the way we were solving last class, we were using identities, which is basically how you can exchange, like substitute one thing for another. It's kind of one way to think about it. And so cosecant, uh, according to this, these ratios over here, is equal to h over y. So that's how I'm going to start. I'm going to start by just substituting here h divided by y. Now this number is just a 3, so we can always turn it into a fraction of over 1. Now here's what this does for me. By rule, h is always positive. So no matter what, this has to be a positive 3. h is positive 3. Well, that means y has to also be positive. Now, we learned last time that you could have a negative and a negative, but since h has to be positive and overall cosecant has to be positive, the y also has to be a positive 1. So if you were going to draw a triangle, you would need to make sure you drew yours where the y-axis is going upward because we know we have a positive y value of one unit. So I'll just put a, an x. We don't know much about the x yet. So I'll just do a normal x-axis. But we do know right off the bat that y is going to have a value of one. So that's going to be our y. We know h will be three. Now we come over here. This says cosine is less than zero. Well, cosine is x over h. So I could say x divided by h is less than zero. And honestly, we know h is 3. So if you wanted to, you could just replace that with a 3. So x divided by 3 is going to be less than 0. And to kind of get an idea about x, I could here get rid of the division of 3. What is the opposite of dividing by 3? Multiplying by 3. That's right. If I multiply both sides by 3, I should have an equivalent uh, equation here. And this is saying x is less than 0 times 3, which is still 0. So x is negative. So what we just determined is if we were going to draw a triangle, we would need to draw it in the second quadrant, meaning it needs to be up one unit, which makes a positive in the first two quadrants. And then because x is less than 0, it's got to be in the second quadrant on the left side. So we'd have some triangle over here where, we again, we don't know the x. So I'm just going to kind of draw diagonal like this. We don't know the x value. That's unknown to us. All we know is it's some negative number. But we do know the h is 3 and we know the y equals 1. We just don't know the x. So how could we solve for the x? With a right triangle, that's what I have here, a right triangle, and I know two sides. How could I solve for the third side? Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem, very good. Thank you. So I have x squared plus y squared equals h squared. Thank you, Journey. 
And when we plug in our numbers, we don't know x. We do know y. And we do know h. So x squared plus 1 times 1 is 1. 3 times 3, or 3 squared, is 9. So we go through this process of solving. Uh, I'm trying to get x by itself. I need to isolate, which means do the opposite. So I'm going to subtract 1. So x squared will equal 8. And how do we get rid of a square? A square root. Yep. Now normally in math, if you add a square root that's not originally there, you need to add a plus or minus. On this problem, we don't need to add a plus or minus, though, because we know that x has to be negative. So I'm just going to put a minus symbol there. x is going to be the negative of the square root of 8, which is the same thing as the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. What I'm doing is I'm breaking the square root down. Since 8 is not prime, it can be reduced. So I'm breaking it down to uh, square root of 4 times square root of 2. And the reason I did this is because we know the square root of 4. What is the square root of 4? 2. So it's negative 2 times the square root of 2. That's our x value. So I'll come over here and replace that. x equals negative 2 square root 2. And now we can find cosine and tangent. Cosine is x over h. So it would be negative square root of 2 over 3. Oops, negative square root of 2 divided by 3. And then tangent will be y over x. I'll let you do that one. What I'm going to show you there real quick is I will uh, show you how you could try this on your own, like using the calculator to solve. Uh, not that this is perfectly guaranteed to work, as it won't give you the positive or negative. At least I don't know how to make it do that. But here's what I could say. If I were going to use the calculator to check this, um, I would need to solve for theta. And so I'll do it this way. I'll say uh, the way you do that, by the way, is you do it inverse to swap the two. So theta here, let me shrink this a little bit. Theta, I just typed in T-H-E-T-A, and it changed that. It, the computer went slow there. Let me type it in again. Theta, there we go. As soon as I hit that A, it changes to a theta. Theta would equal CSC inverse. So an inverse swaps, if you remember that, of 3. Okay, now that's not storing for some reason. That's unfortunate. There we go. If I put theta 1, it works. So it stores the value. And right now it has me in uh, degree mode. So if you're in radian mode, you'll get a different answer. Uh, but for this, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to, I'll leave it in radians, actually. So there's our value for theta 1. And it says theta 1's got to be less than 0. So, or sorry. Let me try this. Cosine of theta 1 needs to be less than 0, which means I need to take the negative of this over here. I need to take the negative. So now if I did that, nope, still not working. I'll play around with this in a second. Uh, I might not know how to do this totally on Desmos. I, either way, I got what theta 1 is. We we're supposed to find cosine. It's giving me this number. I'm going to try it without using the negative, 2 square root 2 divided by 3. Okay, there we go. You can see these match up. I, now, I know I took away the negative, but that's because the cosine was supposed to be negative. If I put a negative there, I put a negative there, there you can see that they match up. So I just used inverse there to solve for theta, and I plugged it in. And so the tangent, uh, if you type that in, let's see here, tangent theta 1. Again, it's going to give the positive, which it should be the negative because of that x value. Whatever your answer was, it should represent uh, this value. So I saw a question in the chat that says, how do you type theta in again? Let me do it as a quote. You type it in T-H-E-T-A, like the ta. The ta. That's how you spell it. What you do is one word, and if you do that without the quotes like I just did there, it'll immediately change. You say T-H-E, the T-A, the ta. It'll change for you like that. Okay, so that's a way of checking. We did get this answer right. Uh, tangent is y over x, so I'll let you do the y over the x. Actually, no, I'll do it because we have to reduce it. That'll be good practice. Let's see here. y over the x. We do not leave a square root in the denominator, so I'm going to shoot that up, which means I now have 1 square root of 2. I'll put the 1 there. 
over negative 2 times 2. So this square root goes away, and so you multiply those twos, which means we would end up with a square root of 2 over negative 4. That's the answer I'm getting. Let's check that out and see if it matches this number. Uh, square root of 2 divided by negative 4. And yes, they're matching up perfectly. So we did our work correctly. So over here is just a way of checking your answers. All right, I'm going to delete all this. If you didn't catch that, just go back and rewind the video. Uh, let's try number two. Number two is where we start doing this simplifying. Now, as I told you last class, chapter five is basically what's so weird about it is we are simplifying rather than solving. So number one, I did give you a problem to solve. But number two, we're just told to simplify. And that's tricky for some students because it doesn't simplifying doesn't just follow set ground rules. So for example, if I said simplify this, well, there's no like set rules. It's not like, well, I need to subtract because it says plus. No, you don't do opposites. When you're simplifying, you just have to look at it and I don't know how else to say it other than follow the mathematical foundation you have of trying to discover what should I do. And in this case, what I just came up with is you need to get a common denominator. That would be the rule here. You multiply by 7 over 7. And then all of a sudden you could simplify this problem and get 37 over 7 as your solution there, so the simplified form. Now, our problem just says simplify and it gives you all this. And many students are going, like, where do I start? I don't know step one. And so last class I gave you an acronym. It said SPOT oil, where each letter, except for oil, represents a specific task to check. So the first thing you should try is to simplify. So the first thing we try to do is simplify, and that can be done two ways, either by canceling, uh, which I will oftentimes write as algebra, but here I'll just write cancel, cancel, or you factor, GCF specifically. Okay, so I want you to look on this one. Can I simplify this by either canceling something or by factoring? Is something shared? X. By the way, I'm right here, spot oil. Let's simplify, we're going to use spot oil. Okay, uh, yes, x is shared, but that's shared within the function, so I can't actually factor out the x. That's a good idea, but keep looking. There is something that's shared in both the terms. So terms just means things that I add or subtract. Something in this term and something in this term are shared. What is shared in both of these? CSC. That's right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the CSC here and the CSC and divide them out. So uh, GCF factoring, greatest common factoring, works kind of like the opposite of distributing. So where like CSC has been distributed here, I'm going to divide it out. And so if I divide CSC by this CSC, I'm left with 1, then comes the minus sign. And then over here, if I divide all this by CSC, I'm just left with cosine squared. And so that first step right there was greatest common factor. Greatest common factor. That's what I just did there. I'm going to write out my steps as we go, which Alex would call algebra. Alex would just call that algebra if you had to label it on homework. Okay, that was step one. So this up here is equal to this right there. So all I did is I factored out CSC. So now I come over here and I say, okay, can I now cancel something or factor something? Answer is no. So the second thing I try is what we call the Pythagorean identity. Pythagorean, I'm just going to write Pythag, identity. And on this one, you're looking for ones or squares. Ones and squares. Well, I'm running out of room. We got one and squares. I'm just going to do that simple. Okay, do you have a one and a square together now? I do right here. No, we have a one and a square. Perfect. So I have a one and a square. That's what I need. This is going to be the Pythagorean identity right here. So this next step, what I will have is C, S, C, X, and then inside this parentheses, we will substitute with whatever its Pythagorean identity is. And so where do I get those? Well, 
I showed you how to formulate them last class, but I'm just going to open up the formula chart here. And to make it easier to find, let me copy this and I'm going to paste it. Oh man, it's going so slow. Here we go. I'm going to paste it right there in between your lesson exam and homework because that's where you're probably going to need it. So let's click that formula chart open. And I'm going to go to the Pythagorean identities and I'm going to look for the one that has a cosine squared. So let me blow this up a little bit. So here's Pythagorean identity. I see it on the left side of the screen. Pythagorean identity right there. Whoops. And what I want to do is look for the one that has cosine in it, which is the first one. Now notice this, this is 1 minus cosine squared. So the algebra to get 1 minus cosine squared means you had to subtract cosine squared. So to get 1 minus cosine squared from 1, I have to subtract cosine squared. So on this, if I subtract on the right, I need to also subtract on the left. If I subtract the cosine squared from the left, all I'm left with is sine squared. So over here, 1 minus sine squared is equal to, excuse me, 1 minus cosine squared is equal to sine squared. That right there is the Pythagorean identity. Now all that is is some algebra, what I did uh, on the formula chart. Okay, and that is the name on Alex. It's the same name as what I just wrote. What I did is basically, let me change colors here. We have sine squared on the formula chart. It says sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. And what I've done is I came in here and I took this. Um, I'm going to leave this as red so I can swap it. And then I'll go purple. Cosine squared theta. Okay, so if you want to get rid of an adding of cosine, you must subtract it. So when I subtract it on both sides, I'm left with negative cosine over there. And now just a sine squared plus nothing. So it's just a sine squared on the left side. Whoops. Why didn't that go together? Sine squared theta. Theta just doesn't want to move. It's comfortable. Well, that's strange. Either way, I'll just leave it with the gap. And so that's what I did to get that identity right there. Okay. So now I'm back over here. So, um, and I'll label these steps. That's the first thing I did. This was the second thing I did. Now we go back and say, okay, can I simplify this? Answer is I can't cancel nor can I factor it. They're not the same. I can't cancel. Okay, can I do Pythagorean identity? I see a squared, but no, can't do Pythagorean identity. I just did that. So number three would be opposite denominator. That's the conjugate. I call it opposite denominator, but we're not going to do that one because I have no denominator. So I'll skip the opposite denominator step. And now I'm going to go to transform. This one is transform. I'm going to transform things to sines and cosines. Transform to sine or cosine. And so I see CSC is not uh, in sine cosine form. So what is CSC equivalent to? So I look right here, right above this is called a reciprocal identity. And I find out that CSC, whoops, keeps swinging on me. There we go. CSC is congruent to 1 over sine. So CSC becomes 1 over sine x. And then I'm going to leave this as it was. I'll just put it in blue here. So you can see that nothing changed from that step. So right there, I just did the third step. I transformed a sine and cosine. Which this, I transformed, let me put transform here. The Alex name for this is the reciprocal identity. Okay, and now finally I come back and I say, okay, I go back to the start. Can I simplify? Can I cancel anything here? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to do a four here because it's going to be the fourth step. We can cancel 
I can cancel one of those signs that's dividing with one of these signs that are multiplying. There's two multiplying, one dividing, so that cancels that one, and I'm left with sine x as my solution. So this was step four. I simplified by canceling. And again, the name that Alex uses for this is algebra. And so all of this right here, that's CSCX minus CSCX cosine squared X is equal to sine X. That's our solution there. We have totally simplified it. So let's check it. I told you earlier, open up a Desmo so we could check our work. And so that's what I'm going to type in here. I'm going to see if these two are congruent when I graph them. So I'll type in CSCX minus CSCX. Now here's the deal in Desmos. So you need to put a multiplication if you have back-to-back -back trig functions. Cosine squared X. Okay, and I think it also helps is if you put parentheses around the letters. There we go. Now it's graphing. Okay, so now there's the graph, and I want to see, is that the same thing as sine X? And you can see the graphs are identical, so we did solve it correctly. Our spot oil, like we just did on the bell ringer. Um, there it is in good form. So snap a picture of that if you need it. Uh, it might be helpful to you. Okay. So let's take a look at lesson 5.2. What we're going to do on lesson 5.2 is notice that I'm going to give you the whole problem. And what all you're going to have to do is verify that they're equal to one another. So what we're saying is the graph of this on the left will match the graph on the right. So if I compare the two here, if I go ahead and graph, let me make this a little bit larger so I can see the whole equation. Uh, fraction here, tangent squared. And I'm going to put the x in parentheses because it helps uh, Desmos graph better anyways, using parentheses around the letter in the trig functions. Sine squared x. Okay, so there's the graph, and we're saying that's going to be equal to secant to the fourth power. Now, I think, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, anything beyond the second power, you can't uh, put that right there for some reason. I don't know what's going on with, with Desmos. I'm going to email them about that. But if I put it there, so as you can see, these two graphs right now are the same. So they're already giving you what you're supposed to get. What we're going to do today is practice, I'm, and the way to do this, to verify, is you start with the more complex side of the equation and you try to work to make it the simple. It is very difficult to go from simple to complex. It's a whole lot easier to go from complex to simple. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to just draw a line down the equal sign so you can see, and I'm just going to separate this up until we get to secant to the fourth power. All right, and so... What's my plan of action? Well, Mr. Voorhees' plan of action is to follow spot oil. And this is what I would recommend you as well when you're doing your homework on Alex, is to first say, okay, can I simplify by canceling? So I have a question for the class. Could I say this one cancels with this one? Does that work with division? Yes. Yeah. So a lot of people think so. It doesn't actually work that way. Think of, I'm gonna go basic. What if it was eight plus one divided by two plus one? Okay, we say, oh, they both have plus, so we can cancel those and the answer is four. Okay, well, what if we did not cancel? Let's see what we would get. What is eight plus one? Nine. And what is two plus one? Three. What is nine divided by three? Three. Okay. Did that math work? No. no. So you can. The rule is that would be canceling a term. Terms add and subtract. You're never allowed to cancel terms, but you can cancel factors. So only if it's multiplying. So I can't actually simplify anything. So then I go. Can I do Pythagorean? That's where you look for ones and squares. Remember, we're looking for ones and squares. Yeah, and technically we have two ones and squares. So I'm going to pull over my formula chart, and I'm first going to look for the one with tangent squared. So I'm going to Pythagorean. Here it is. One plus tangent squared, which is equivalent to tangent squared plus one, equals secant squared. So the first thing I'm going to do here 
is in the numerator, I'm going to say that is equal to secant squared. So the formula chart says that 1 plus tangent squared theta equals secant squared theta. So that's how I got that. This is formula chart. Now I also see that I have a 1 and a squared there. So I'm going to go down to the formula chart and see this one's not as good a form. The formula chart says that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Well, on our problem, we don't have that. We have it rearranged. Notice uh, they have it as 1 minus sine squared. So if I minus the sine squared across, that would cancel out this sine squared here. If I subtract the sine squared, it would cancel that sine squared, but I'd be left with cosine. So I'm going to put here a cosine squared x. Okay, so both of those were the Pythagorean identity. So I'll write that step right here, Pythagorean identity. And so you don't think I'm changing secant to the fourth. Let me actually move that over. Let's do it straight across. Okay. I guess I could just do it like a little dotted line here. Nah, this is too much. I'll just leave it like that. Okay, so now what do I do? Well, I go back and say, can I simplify by either canceling or factoring? And the answer is no. Nothing cancels and nothing can factor. So then I say, can I do a Pythagorean? I see squares, but I don't see a one, so I'm going to skip Pythagorean. Then I say, okay, do I have an opposite denominator? That means like a, a 1 minus sine and a 1 plus sine. And no, I don't. So I move on. Can I transform anything to a sine or cosine? And the answer is yes. So I have something that's not a sine or cosine. So transform means make it a all, everything either sines or cosines. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the secant squared. I'm going to take the secant squared and change it. So I'm going to look over here on the reciprocal identity and I'm looking for secant squared. And here it is. Secant squared, I don't know why it jerks the formula chart around whenever I click it, but secant squared is the same as 1 over cosine. So what I can do to get rid of the secant squared is I can make it cosine in the denominator. So secant squared by itself can become cosine squared in the denominator. So what am I left with? This becomes a 1 over cosine squared x times cosine squared x. That right there was the reciprocal identity. Okay, let's do a little simplifying now. Now I can simplify. I don't know why I wrote simplify. I don't have to do that. Uh, what is cosine squared times cosine squared? The power of 2 times the power of 2. How many powers do I have? If that's two cosines, that's another two cosines. How many cosines do I have when they multiply? Two. Uh, no, I already have two. And I have two more. So now how many do I have? Four. Thank you. From the chat, I have four. Okay, now I'm going to come over here and say I'm trying to get to secant to the fourth power. How, what is secant? Well, remember secant is the same thing as one over cosine. So a one over cosine to the fourth is equivalent to, if I shot this up, or it's equal to secant to the fourth power. Because they're reciprocals of one another. So cosine in the denominator is the same thing as secant in the numerator. So now I have verified my identity. We just usually do a check. Oh, by the way, that's called the reciprocal identity again. When I shift anything uh, from the top to the bottom like that, that's called a reciprocal so it's a reciprocal identity when everything something shifts from the numerator to the denominator like that, and it will switch from cosine to secant in that case. And so these two are equivalent. So that's kind of the idea of what it means to verify that you have an identity. 
So now I have this one for you to try. And uh, by the way, part of uh, the first step, we haven't seen this before, when I say simplify, is to cancel. And so I will start this problem for you. This one, it's a whole lot easier if you think of trying to simplify your problem as you work it by canceling the one. You have a number on both sides. You could come on your like terms and say, okay, let me subtract one and go from there. So you'd be left with 1 minus cosine squared x equals, this goes away, sine squared x. So that step right there was what Al uh, Alex would call algebra. I just simplified it. And now you can think, how do I get from there to there to name that step? Verify that negative 2 cotangent x equals all of this. Now, you might remember at the start, I said always it's a lot easier if you start on the more complex side of the equation. So this time, when I do example two, I'm going to start on the right side of my equation. I'm going to start over here and work to the left because that's a lot more simple. I'm going to write up uh, spot oil. And we're going to see something that we only got to do very briefly in lesson 5.1, and that's what I call the opposite denominator. And that's where I'm going to start on this one. So I can't simplify anything. I would love to say you could simplify these two, like cancel out those signs, but it requires a common denominator. We do not have a common denominator, so I can't simplify. I have ones, but I don't have squares. So instead I'm going to do what's called a, what I call an opposite denominator. The actual name is a conjugate. And so here's how that works. I'm going to be trying to get a common denominator. That's the whole goal here. So I'm going to have sine x over, and instead of it just being 1 plus cosine x, to get a common denominator, if you remember this from earlier in your math days, is you multiply by the factor it's missing. So this has a factor of 1 plus cosine, but it does not have the factor 1 minus cosine. So I'm going to remember, uh, the, the 1 by itself is a term, so I'm not saying it's missing a term, it's missing this entire factor. So you multiplied by the factors it's missing, not the terms. Factors mean multiply and divide. So that's what, if you're going to multiply the denominator, you also need to multiply the numerator. Because ultimately this means I'm multiplying this by 1, which doesn't change the problem. However, as long as I don't cancel these out, I'll have a common denominator when I combine it with the next fraction. So this is how a conjugate looks. So remember, I'm starting with... 1 minus cosine x, but if I want it to have a common denominator, it's got to be multiplied by the factor it's missing, which is 1 plus cosine x. Now that right there is called the conjugate. And now I think on Alex they might actually call it algebra. I can't remember. So I'll put it here just in case algebra in parentheses, but it's truthfully called a conjugate. That's what mathematicians would call this, what I'm doing right now. Now I'm going to multiply this out. Uh, it's going to be a big time distribution. So I distribute the top here. And notice I have a common denominator. So I can write this as one fraction if I'd like. So I'll have a sine x. And then a sine times a negative cosine will be a negative sine x cos x. I know that's weird, but that's how you write that. It's a negative sine x cos x. And then I'm going to distribute this negative sign through. I'm taking the negative with it. So it'll be minus sine x. And then a negative sign times a positive cosine is a negative sine x cos x. And the denominator, I would have, remember it's common, they're both shared, so it becomes one denominator here. One times one, I'm doing FOIL now. One times one is one. 1 times a negative cosine, it's a negative cosine. Cosine times 1 is a positive cosine. And then cosine times negative cosine is a negative cosine squared. That is the conjugate step. It looks long, but there is a shortcut to this. What's the shortcut? Every time you ever do an opposite denominator, you're going to end up with a Pythagorean identity. Notice these two values cancel. An opposite denominator, the two steps, the, the FOIL, the O and the I, 
will end up canceling each other out. And so you're left with just the first times first and last times last, which will be a Pythagorean identity. So a shortcut in the future, whenever we see we have this relationship, is I don't have to write all this out. I can just say, okay, the denominator is going to be 1, and then multiply these two, or 1 times 1, first times first, and then last times last. That became my denominator. 1 times 1 is 1. Positive cosine times negative cosine is a negative cosine squared. So that's the shortcut in the future. Now let's see what happened on the numerator. I have a sine x minus sine x cos x minus sine x. Oh, this is nice. I have a positive sine x and a negative sine x. Those go away. And then here I have a negative sine x cos x and a negative sine x cos x. It looks like I have two, negative two sine x cos x's. I have two negative sine x cos x's, so I'll put it as negative two sine x cos x all over one minus cosine squared x. So what did I do there? I did, I simplified basically, which is called algebra on Alex. Okay, so now from here, why do you do the opposite denominator? Well, to get a common denominator and also it'll give us always a Pythagorean identity. So if I go to my formula chart, you might be getting used to this one by now. Uh, formula chart, there it is. One minus cosine squared comes from subtracting the cosine squared across. So it'd be one minus cosine squared equals, and all that'd be left over here is a sine squared. So I will say this is equal to, um, what I'm doing is I'm gonna remove this with the Pythagorean identity. Negative two sine x cos x over sine squared x. I did the Pythagorean identity there. Now finally, let's get our answer. I see I have a sine x in the numerator. Whoops, I'm supposed to change colors there. Let me try this again. And I have two in the denominator, so I can cancel one of those out. Which leaves me with negative two cosine x over sine x. And that right there was algebra. I simplified again. And then finally, Cosine divided by sine, if I went through my steps, I haven't been going through these very well, I'm sorry. And so I just simplified, I could try to Pythagorean, there's nothing, I can't, I don't have an opposite denominator anymore. Ah, I could transform these. I have cosine over sine, that is the same thing as cotangent, that is x over y. That's a cotangent, which is exactly what we have on this side. So let me put the white barrier over here. And uh, order move to front. Whoops, I wanted to not move forward. I want it all the way to the front. Bring to front. There we go. That right there is equal to negative 2 cotangent x. Because cotangent is x over y or cosine over sine. So we verified our identity. And that last step right there is called the quotient identity. Quotient identity is what they call that. When you change cotangent into a quotient, cosine divided by sine. And so we did our work correctly. Now, you could check it out, but since they gave it to us, I'm pretty sure these are going to match up from the get-go. If we wanted to check all this, uh, negative, oops, negative 2 cotangent x equals why isn't it not sorry there it is uh, sine x over 1 plus cos x minus sine x over 1 minus cos x you can see these two do match up perfectly so that's what you do if they didn't give it to you at the start, but we already knew they did, and so that would be your solution there. All right, let's, this time I'm going to try this one together with you, 
and walk you through basically the same process. So remember, whenever you see something like this with a 1, but it's not a square, that's where we do the opposite denominator or the conjugate. Okay, so this time around, it looks a little tricky, but we're actually going to do uh, the exact same thing again. So what do I mean by that? So I'm looking, and I don't have an opposite denominator per se, like this doesn't say 1 minus sign, but I know if I multiply this by a 1 minus sign, like I, a 1 minus cosine, like I did on the previous problem right here, I will later on end up with a sine squared. So on this problem, this is going to be a little tricky, but I'll do it two steps so you can see it. I'm going to start on the more complex side. What I would do on this problem is I would multiply this fraction by that 1 minus cosine. So let me just take this first part. I'll do it in blue. The first part, I'm not going to change. 1 over cosine x. Excuse me, 1 plus cosine x over sine x. There we go. And the second fraction is sine x over 1 plus cosine x. Here would be what I would do on this one. Again, I'm trying to follow spot oil. So if possible, you would simplify. I cannot cancel those two. Those are not the same fraction, nor could I cancel these ones. So then I try the Pythagorean. I don't have any squares. I see ones, but no squares. Now I would get to opposite denominator, this conjugate. And that's what I would actually do here, is I would multiply this by a 1 minus cosine x. Now the reason I'm going to do that is because ultimately, this right here will create a sine squared. And so I can get a common denominator over here by just multiplying top and bottom by sine, which we'll see in a second. So first, let me go step by step. Since I'm not changing the first part portion, I'll leave that. Oh, this step, let me write it out here. This is called a conjugate. That step right there. So I have 1 plus cosine x over sine x plus, I'll distribute this, uh, let me change colors, sine x minus sine x cos x all over, now remember when you foil a conjugate you're going to hit first times first which is one times last times last, negative cosine squared. And that right there is just algebra. I simplified the problem. Okay, so now what do I want to do? Well, I can tell that this is going to become a sine squared. That's Pythagorean identity. Uh, 1, if I subtract over the cosine squared, I see I have a 1 and cosine squared. So I'm going back through this. I can't cancel, but I can do Pythagorean identity. I can see that uh, I have a 1 and a square there. So if I subtract it over, it becomes a sine squared. So here I go again. Can I just maybe copy this? Copy this one. There we go. Clone. Okay. So the front part stays the same, and on the right part, I'm going to say all of this becomes sine squared, right there. Ooh, I just realized something. If I could back it up, now that I know this is sine squared, let me put that in there, actually. I think at this stage, I'm working through the problem, and this sometimes happens. It would have been better for me not to distribute the sine squared through I will show you why. I'm going to go back and pretend I did not distribute the top, okay? I'm just going to go right here. You can leave it distributed, but I'm going to undistribute it. So I'm going to act like I did not do this step there. So this is, uh, I'm going to refer above. So I'm going to just kind of scratch this out for a second. And we're going to leave it as it was right up there. The, let me color coordinate this. Sine x times, um, it was in red, 1 minus cos x. Okay. So why did I do that? Because I just realized it's going to save us a lot of work. If I leave it that way, look what happens. I have a sine x in the numerator and two sines on the bottom. And these are factors now. Since it's multiplying, I can cancel this one with this one. Oh, I forgot to write. The first thing we did there is Pythagorean identity. It 
And now I canceled that, which is going to leave me with one minus cosine x over sine x. Now that step right there would be called algebra. Okay, almost done here. Now, do I have a common denominator? You bet. Since I have a common denominator, I can now combine these as one fraction. So, as it, when it becomes one fraction, my denominator is sine, and it has one plus another one, that's two, cosine, uh, a positive cosine and a negative cosine, those will cancel each other out. So it's just two over sine. Now that right there would be called algebra. So I did algebra and another little thing of algebra. Now why am I not writing it down below? Because ultimately this is going to be our answer. That right there, two over sine x is equivalent to two cosecant x. I'll show you how I got that from the formula chart. That right there is equal to two cosecant x. Those are one and the same, and that is called the reciprocal identity. I will show you on the formula chart. All right, let me extend this just a little bit further. There we go. Okay, on the formula chart, reciprocal identity. If you have sine in the denominator, here it is, sine in the denominator, like I do here, you can move it up to the numerator, but when you do so, it becomes its reciprocal, which is cosecant. So that sine just gets shot up top and becomes a cosecant when you do the reciprocal. And thus, that would be your solution there. You know the nice thing about chapter five? Are these problems are really short. Three. Now, on this one, it was a little bit tricky, is I say normally start on the more complex side, but you look at it and it's like, well, this one has a fraction, which is complex, and this one is just longer. So which one's more complex? Well, I don't know. So there is one trick that, um, that the notes don't actually show you yet, and that is that you can honestly work on both sides if you prefer. What I'm gonna do is, um, I will start on the fraction side, and we might have to come back and work on the right side as well to get it. Like, I see that there's something in common right here. They both have a cotangent, and it might be easy to factor that out. But for the time being, I'm going to start on the left side. I'm going to say that the fraction side is more uh, complex, because usually fractions are, and we'll work towards the right. So following spot oil, I first say, okay, can I cancel anything on the left side? No. Pythagorean. Do I have a 1 and a squared? No, I have a 1 but no squared. Do I have like an opposite denominator set up? And that's yes, I have a 1 with something that's not squared. This is when we use opposite denominator or conjugate is the actual name. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first write down in blue what we have. And that's secant x minus 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by its conjugate because this will create a Pythagorean identity. So its conjugate is secant x plus one, because it already has a minus one. So if I multiply the bottom by that, I need to also multiply the numerator by the secant x plus one. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do. Let me scoot this over a little bit so it's in line. Just never know how much space I'm gonna take up. And that right there we would call a conjugate, or algebra on Alex. I, I just can't remember what Alex actually calls it. If it calls it a conjugate or if it calls it algebra. But it'll call it one or the other. Okay, so now let's multiply this out and see what we come up with. So I'll distribute this. And it looks like we're going to have a sec sine x secant x. That's unusual. Sine x secant x. And then we'll also have a plus sine x. Over... Uh, this is a conjugate, so the shortcut for conjugates is just go first times first, secant squared x, last times last, minus 1. Now I have a squared and a 1. Right there, that's called algebra. 
I just multiplied stuff. So I did FOIL there. Okay, now uh, I have a squared and a 1. So I go to look at the Pythagorean identities. So on my chart, I'm trying to zoom over. It won't go all the way over. So that's as far as you can see. And I'm looking for secant squared. There it is, secant squared. Now, if it was going to be secant squared minus 1, that means I've subtracted this 1 over. So if I subtracted the 1 over, I'm left with tangent squared. So all of this right here, that right there is the Pythagorean identity, and that's going to be equal to tangent squared. So I'm back, and I, uh, again, I'm seeing that I shouldn't have distributed this one. I'm going to take it back. I know I just did this in the last problem, and I'll show you why. It's a kind of a tricky little thing here, but it will, no, I'll, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to GCF this back. Sorry, I'm going to go backwards. That's what happens when you work a lot of these. You'll have to go back and forth. There's, it's the nature of these problems. There's no set pattern when you're simplifying. That's what's kind of tricky about it. I give you this just as a heads up, but I'm going to leave it like this. Now, you might be thinking, how or why did you go backwards? Well, we go Pythagorean. Let me write first. That was the Pythagorean identity. Well, the reason I did this, so here in a second, I'll scratch this out. I'm going to rewrite that. Actually, I'll just do it right now. And let me erase that right there. Okay. So it was sine x times secant x plus 1. Okay. Now, why am I doing that? Well, because I'm here and I have. I'm looking at their answer. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Okay. I have tangent squared x. And here's what I know about tangent. As I know, tangent is equivalent to y over x. Tangent squared equals sine x over, not tangent squared, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it would be sine squared over cosine squared. Now, that's what I know. And so I know in a second it's going to cancel with some of these. But first, to do this right, what I need to do to help myself out is I'm going to move this tangent up top. Now, that's a reciprocal. So whenever you move something from top to bottom, I need to look at the reciprocals over here. And let me find here. So I'm on the reciprocals. And I'm looking for tangent in the denominator. There it is. Tangent in the denominator is the same thing as cotangent up above. So when I move this, I'm going to be left with sine x times secant x plus 1 times cotangent squared x. That right there is called the reciprocal identity. Uh, if I was following spot oil, I would have said I can't simplify, I can't do Pythagorean, I don't have an opposite denominator anymore, but I can transform. So I transform this like that, and now what I'm going to do is transform one more time, cotangent. Now what is cotangent? If, sine, if tangent was... Uh, sine over cosine, y over x, cotangent is x over y, cosine, oops, I need to use the same variable, cosine over sine. And so this time what I'm going to do is what's called the quotient identity. And let me cover up uh, this blue line there. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this and say, okay, that right there is equivalent to Cotangent is equivalent to cosine squared over sine squared. Now, why do I do that? That's called the quotient identity. Well, because I now can cancel, since this is all multiplying, these are like factors. And so I could come in through here and cancel this one with that one. And so I have, uh, and I, let me check what I have here. I'm, I think I'm going to need to distribute this one. Yeah, I'm going to distribute this through this time around. Uh, I will distribute this through. So I'm doing a little algebra here. I will have a secant x cosine squared x. Secant x cosine squared x 
plus cosine squared x. Now all of that needs to be divided by sine. So uh, I'm going to break apart the, these two pieces and say that's divided by sine and this is divided by sine. If you're going, why am I doing two denominators? Well, because my answer when I looked up, it's two separate terms. Okay, uh, that right there is algebra, and now let's finish this problem off. We are almost done with it, believe it or not. I can transform one more time this secant right here. Secant in the numerator is the same thing as cosine the denominator. I can shoot it down, and I can make this become, uh, we have a cosine squared x up top. This secant becomes a cosine x times a sine x. And then over here, I have plus cosine x, and I'm going to rewrite this so you can see it different, times cosine x all over sine x. Um, let me shift this and get my line down here. All right, if you're not struggling right now, you're not paying attention. This is some complex math here. So let's just see. I just did what's called a reciprocal. I sent the secant to the bottom. That's a reciprocal identity. And so now when I look to solve this, I can go back to spot oil. I could simplify. I have a cosine that cancels with one of those cosines. And so that right there that right there happens to be equal to cosine over sine is, and so I'm going to do simplifying here, uh, algebra is what Alex will call this, I'll do a little algebra. Cosine over sine is cotangent. And then over here, I will make one of these, let me see their order. They call it cos then cotangent. Okay, I'm going to go back, let me take this away. I'm going to make this also a cotangent. So both of these become cotangents. So I have cotangent x plus this cosine stays alone, but this also becomes a cotangent x. That right there is called the quotient identity. And that would be our answer. All right, so like I said, this becomes a lot of work frequently. A whole lot of work. Alright, let's try this one together. So this time um, I'm gonna ask you where should we begin? How do you know where to begin? Left side or right side? Right. No left side. Okay. How left do we Yeah okay. I would start on the left side because it's a fraction. Very good. And so we'll write out spot oil here. So left side because it's a fraction. Can I simplify by canceling? Yes or no? No. No. Do I have Pythagorean? Do I have a one and a squared? No. No. But I do have a one with a trig function by itself, which means I can do the opposite denominator. The way to make this Pythagorean is to do an opposite denominator with it. So I'm going to take what I'm given, the sine x over 1 minus cosine x, and I'm going to multiply that by its opposite denominator, or its conjugate, 1 plus cosine x. Before I get ahead of myself, let's see if I should be simplifying or leaving it separate. Uh, this time, I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to distribute the top. Okay, So that right there is called a conjugate. Uh, you could. It's not like you're wrong if you do it one way or the other. It's just one might be shorter than the other. And we'll see if I'm right or wrong, whether I was better off if I distribute. But I'm going to say let's not distribute the top right now. I will foil out the bottom though. So the conjugate, always shortcut, it'll become first times first times last times last. Negative cosine squared x. That right there is called algebra when you multiply that out. And I'm going to leave the numerator alone. 
and I'll show you why I think we should do that here in a second. Remember, don't cancel this out. That's We added that intentionally, so don't cancel those out. We want to multiply the bottom. Now I have 1 plus minus cosine squared, which is going to be a Pythagorean identity. Anytime you apply the opposite denominator, you end up with a Pythagorean identity. So I come over here, and I'm going to look on my Pythagorean identities, specifically for the one that involves the cosine, which is the first. What's happened is they've subtracted cosine squared across. So this right here, that right there, is going to be equivalent to sine squared. If you can imagine a little math moving around, this cosine squared being subtracted from both sides of the equations, you'd have sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. So that is cosine or sine squared. And then up top, I still have my sine x times 1 plus cosine x. So that right there was the Pythagorean identity. So whenever you do an opposite denominator, you almost always follow it immediately with a Pythagorean identity. Those almost go back to back. OK, now I'm going to ask you, can I simplify anything by canceling or factoring? I can. I have a sign here and two signs right there. So what I'm going to do is cancel that out. That's what we call algebra. Well, doesn't that one have a square? It does. It'll just yeah, take, well, it takes away one of them. And I'm now going to write this as two separate fractions. It, I'll show you why. I'm going to write this as 1 over sine x plus Actually, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll do it this way, 1 over sine x. So I just split the common denominator between the two, like that. Now, why did I write that? It's because ultimately, 1 minus sine x, uh, I'll do that part in blue. I said blue. Come on, board. Uh, still one going. Am I running out of blue ink? This right there? 1 minus sine x, if I look on the uh, formula chart, 1 over sine x right there is equal to cosecant. And then on this side, cosine divided by sine is cotangent. And so that what I just did there was the reciprocal identity. That's the 1 over portion. That's the reciprocal reciprocal and on this side it was the quotient identity and that would be our solution I hope we're having just so much fun right now, huh? Now, look at this problem. It's very clear to see which side is more complex than the other. Uh, it's so long on the left side, but yet the right side is very short. So we're going to definitely be working the left side. Now, sometimes when we start our spot oil, the thing that many students overlook is that S can represent not only simplifying by canceling, but it can also mean to factor something out that's shared. So on this problem, as I look across, I see that cosine is shared in both of these. So what I'm going to do is factor out that cosine. It's kind of like the opposite of distribution. And it leaves me with secant squared x times tangent x minus tangent cubed x. Okay, now out right there was just taking a GCF, which Alex will call algebra. I'll put it over here, GCF. That's all I did there is I took a GCF out. Now, I'm trying to get to sine x. You might be going, how do I get all of this to sine x? Well, very simply, uh, this one, if you start doing transforming, let's go through it. Can I cancel? No, there's nothing in there that cancels. Can I do Pythagorean? I see squared and a uh, cube, but I don't see ones and squares, so I move on. 
Do I have an opposite denominator? No, I have no denominator. Can I transform to sines and cosines? Yes. So I'm going to take this secant first, and so we'll say we have cosine times. Now secant, if I transform to sines and cosines, I'm looking at the reciprocal identities. Secant, secant by itself, is 1 over cosine, so secant squared would be 1 over cosine squared. 1 over cosine squared. Now tangent, and I'm going to write this a little differently this, this time, is that is a reciprocal identity. Let me write reciprocal. Tangent, if I transform that to sines and cosines, is sine is y, cosine is x, tangent is y over x, which means it's sine divided by cosine. That one is not on the formula chart, which that is called a quotient identity. And I'm going to do that again right here. So let me finish this in, identities. All right, so now we're here. So what happens next? Well, now if I distribute this math through, so I'm going to multiply times this first term and the second term. What I can see is this cosine is going on over here. will cancel with one of these three cosines, so that one goes away. And it'll also cancel with one of these three and make it just two. So now I can see I have a common denominator. They both have two cosines. So let me just cosine squared x like that. They both have cosine squared. And I'm left with sine x minus sine cubed x. That right there is just some algebra. And so now I'm back up to my spot oil. I just simplified. Like, uh, or I distributed, I, that's what I really did, I distributed. Now, can I simplify by either canceling or factoring? And yes, I can, I can factor again. These both share a sine x. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, let me show you. If I take out a sine x from up top, I'm left with one minus sine squared let me write that all in blue. So I'm taking out a sine x from up top. So I'm left with 1 minus sine squared x over this part I'll leave in black. Cosine squared x. So right there, I just did more algebra. I factored. Let me get some white space here. Okay, so now I'm looking at this. What can I do? I can't simplify by canceling. Do I have Pythagorean anywhere? Do I have a 1 in the square? Yes. Yes, I have a 1 in the square, so I do Pythagorean identity. 1 minus sine squared, if you're not used to that one yet. Come on now. Pythagorean identity. 1 minus sine squared would mean I need to subtract that sine squared over, which leaves me with cosine squared. So I would have sine x times cosine squared x all over cosine squared x. That was the Pythagorean identity right there. I'm just going to say Pythag identity. And now I can also see I have, I, I'm not to spot oil, I can simplify. Cosine cancels with sub cosine, that's sine x, by doing a little algebra right there. And we finish this problem. So you've just seen these a bunch of times, and that's really what it takes. It just, it takes a lot of practice. You just have to go through and get used to it. Okay, so let's get one more here. I'm looking at the clock. Um, 
I recognize where we are. Let's get one more through. So as I look at this one, I'm trying to do spot oil. I first look, is there anything I can actually cancel? And the first step, there rarely is anything you can cancel, but there might be something you can factor. So is there something shared all the way across? Uh, let's see here. CSC, this has a CSC. This has a cosine and no CSC. Okay, so these both share cotangent, these both share co cosecant, but not all the way across. So I can't really do that. I could say, do I have Pythagorean ones and squares? No. Do I have opposite denominators? No. Could I transform anything to sines and cosines? Yes, I could. So CSC is the same thing as one over sine. And so this is going to become one over sine x. And then next fraction, that has another one over sine x. By the way, that's a reciprocal, that's a reciprocal identity, both of those. I should have probably just done both of them in purple. I'll change both of those. Okay, and continue on over here. Uh, cotangent. Cotangent is the same thing as, that right there, is cosine over sine. And then finally, cotangent, one more time, is cosine over sine. So the purple was a reciprocal identity. These are called a quotient identity. Uh, when you change a tangent or cotangent to a cosine over sine or vice versa, that's called a quotient identity. Over here, the purple is called a reciprocal identity. And so I did both of them. I can see I have a common denominator here. They all have a denominator of sine. So if I simplified all this, I could say everything's going to be over sine. It looks like I have a 1 minus a cosine x minus a cosine squared x plus a cosine. And I can cancel these cosines. I have a negative cosine and a positive. That right there is just doing algebra. So that means I have 1 minus cosine squared x over sine x. Does anybody know what 1 minus cosine squared x is off the top of their head? It's a 1 and a square, so we should be looking at Pythagorean, Pythagorean identities. I subtract the cosine squared. I'm left with sine squared. So all of this right there is equal to sine squared. That's the Pythagorean identity. And I can just come in and say, okay, those two cancels out. I'm left with sine x. And that last step was just doing some algebra. This one notes that uh, sometimes you can actually work a problem by working two sides at, uh, simultaneously. Like you don't have to just pick a side and work from it. All right. Now I, I wouldn't necessarily. Um, I don't have any ideas of like good rules to tell you when to do this and when not to. So what I would recommend is to first start with one side. And so I'm going to start with the left side just because I have an idea of what to do. But you could start on the right, you could start on both. But I'm just going to start the left. So I'm going to just, even though you might say, well, it doesn't look necessarily more complex, well, I'm going to because I know I can do the S step. I can simplify something. I cannot say that's cotangent to the fourth power. When you add, they don't combine like that. But I could factor out a cotangent. You see how the, both these terms have a cotangent? I could do the opposite of distribution, which means the greatest common uh, factor, and say they both have a cotangent. I will factor that out. And when I factor that out, I'm left with cotangent squared plus 1. So I divide out a cotangent from both of these two terms. So it's now cotangent squared and a 1. 
and that part is now out front. So that's a little algebra for you. Specifically, it's a GCF. GCF. Okay, from there, I go back to spot oil. I can't simplify, but do I have a square to one? You bet. So I'm going to look on my Pythagorean identities. On the three formulas, I'm looking for the cotangent squared formula. So formula one, formula two, formula three. There it is. Now notice this one says one plus cotangent squared. Just manipulate in your brain. Okay, if it's supposed to be cotangent squared plus one, that means I'm just swapping the order. I can do that. So what is cotangent squared plus one equal to? Cosecant squared. So I'll come back over here. And we're going to say, according to the Pythagorean identity, that this is equal to cosecant squared. So I'm doing the Pythagorean identity here. We're going to say that that's going to equal cotangent times this becomes cosecant squared. And now I'm looking at what I'm supposed to have. And I see I'm really close. This has a cosecant cubed. This one's squared. That's a cotangent. That's a cosine. All right, so I want you to think through here. Sine is y, and I'm not going to write this silent x. Sine is y. Silent H, I meant to say. Cosine's x. Tangent is y over x. Okay, so in the case of cotangent, cotangent would be x over y, which means it is cosine over sine. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this cosine right there, or cotangent, I'm sorry, and I'm going to exchange that. I'm going to say that is the same thing as cosine over sine. Now that right there we call a quotient identity. Whenever you turn a tangent or a cotangent into sines and cosines, you call that a quotient identity. So now I'm looking at what I'm supposed to get to again. And I'm even closer. I now have the cosine, but I don't have three cosecants. Well, I do know something about sine. Sine in the denominator, if I go to my reciprocal identities, sine in the denominator is cosecant. Sine in the denominator is a cosecant in the numerator. So last step here is I would, you could take this sine and shoot it up using a reciprocal identity, and I'll have my, uh, my answer. I have cosine times CSCX times CSC squared X, which is equal to cosine X CSC cubed X. And thus we solve the problem. All right, let's see it. Uh, one more time. Again, I didn't even have to work the right side. This was saying you could have, but I did not have to. All right, and here's another problem. Again, you could pick the left, the right, anything like that. Um, uh, when I look at this, I'm seeing a lot of squares, which would make us think Pythagorean. Okay, the problem is I don't have tangent and sine together. There's the tangent formula. Here's the sine formula. Over here, it's the same kind of concept. So what would I recommend doing? Hmm, I don't know. We're just going to have to kind of play around with it and check. Um, I have a, a minus sign. Um, what I'm going to do to play around, I'm going to just try to transform the sign. Okay, sine squared. What do I know about sine squared? Well, I know sine squared from the Pythagorean identity is equal to 1 minus cosine squared. So right now, I'm just playing around trying to come up with a plan. I mean, I could find spot oil, but there's nothing to do on simplifying. So right now, I'm just trying to do the best guess here. It's kind of guesswork, uh, trying to analytically think through this. So what will I have here? I'll have a tangent squared minus sine squared is equal to 1 minus cosine squared. 
So, so far I'm there. And I'm looking, I might be like, ah, I don't know if that's really getting me where I want to be. And you could try it on the same side over here. You try it. Now, since I'm working on both sides at once, I could say, well, over here, this is also a 1 minus cosine squared. And this would be multiplying times a tangent squared. So now I'm trying to work on both sides to see if this is going to help me out. On the left, I now have a tangent squared. I'm going to distribute the minus, minus 1 plus a cosine squared. Over here, when I distribute, I'll have a tangent squared minus a cosine squared x tangent squared x. Ooh, I know something I could do over here. Sorry, I'm running out of time. Let's go fast here. What I can do with the tangent is I can change that to sine over cosine. When I do that, these two cancel, and I have tangent squared minus sine squared. Now check this out. I just realized I shouldn't have worked the left side because that is exactly where I started off on. So the, the kind of the concept of this example is just to show you, sometimes you just have to play around with it and see what happens. Both of them, as it turned out, I solved using one side only. But I was kind of playing around and just trying to get it come up with a technique because I didn't have a good one to begin with. Uh, let's summarize lesson 5-2. Uh, here are the textbook strategies for verifying trigonometric identities. You can look through this. Uh, it's basically what I've kind of given you as what I call spot oil here. This is kind of like the textbook's way of kind of looking at things. They just do bullet point. And so it, it kind of starts with the most complicated side, which we, we've talked about. I didn't include that in spot oil. But then it says use reciprocal, quotient, Pythagorean, or other basic trigonometric identities. Okay, so this would be the reciprocal and quotient as part of the T in spot oil. Pythagorean, sorry about that, that is an ugly T. And those two together would be the T. The Pythagorean uh, would be the P. Other basic, I'm not sure what they're referring to, but that, those are those two. So algebraic is the simplifying. That's this S. Okay, convert the denominator. That's the opposite denominator right there. That one right there would be the O. So you can see we have the S, the P, the O, the T. And work each individual side. These are just other strategies. So I guess the other basic might be the oil. So other basic trigonometry would be other identities listed, oil. So that's kind of the idea there. So now, let's take a look at, I can't believe I still have this on here. Okay, how you could identify using technology. We've talked about it as we've gone, and you kind of just got a sneak peek there. If you wanted to test whether something's identity, you could, one, graph it. And so, uh, the specifically said to graph, if you uh, look at this, it says, to use a graphing calculator. What it really means is you graph each side of the equation and see if they're equal to one another. So 1 plus tangent x, excuse me, tangent squared x over cosecant. And on Desmos, if you're going to have two tangent or two trigonometric functions multiplying, you need to use parentheses around the angle. And I want to make sure I'm in radian modes, which I am. Hit that little wrench there. And so there's the graph of the left side. And now we're going to try the right side to see if this is an identity. Now, as I see they're overlapping, what does that mean? That means they are an identity. So these, this would be an identity. It is an identity here. OK, and so um, and that picture would prove so. And again. Here, well, I'll just use this graph. Let's just show you here. Instead of me typing in, if I graph the left side, and notice with cubes, it's weird on Desmos. You can't just hit, it won't graph it. 
uh, if you did like sine cubed with an x, nothing graphs, even if you put a y equals on the front. Nothing graphs. It's a, it's a weird thing with Desmos that you, if it's something cubed, what you need to do is put a parenthesis around the angle and then put the cube. And then all of a sudden you'll start to see the graph. So that's just a little FYI there. So when I graph that, if you notice, I put the cube after the x's. And it looks like I didn't even type that equation in right, so we need to correct that anyway. So here we go. It's cosine. Like I said, I'm going to have to put the cube after the x. That needs to be a minus sine. Uh, let's put that in parentheses and cube it all over cosine and be safe, I'll put a parenthesis there, minus sine x. Okay, so there's that graph, and now let's graph the right side, it's cosine, the squared, you can, if it's a squared, you can put that in the correct location and everything should function fine on Desmos. So cosine x minus sine x, and as I see this one, this is in fact a not the right solution. There's still not an identity, so that part's correct. But my graph that I copied was not accurate at all. Let me kind of do it like this so I can copy this and paste it here for us. You can see that that wasn't right. Order send the back. Okay, so there it is that those would not be an identity. All right, so now here is one for you to try. All right, now let's take a look at the ACP problems here. They're review, so that means it's not this lesson, but older lessons. It says, point P is rotated 315 degrees counterclockwise around a circle with a diameter of 14 feet. If the center of the circle is at the origin, which coordinates represent the location of P prime relative to the center? Well, first what I'm gonna do here is I see it's a circle, so the thing I should do in trigonometry, if it's a circle, is use my unit circle here. Uh, for a second, I'm gonna cover up the bottom problem to help us see, and then, uh, so, the, it's 14 feet diameter. So the first thing I want to point out is this. If the diameter is 14, that means this radius here equals 7. Now using the unit circle, I'm looking for 315 degrees. So now I'll rotate this up here. And I can see 315 degrees is found right there, which generates this point. That's the cosine, that's the sine at 315 degrees. That's all for the unit circle. The unit circle, the reason they call it a unit circle is because the radius equals one. That's our idea. For a unit circle, the radius equals one. So this radius equals seven, which means I need to multiply seven by the point square root of two over two comma negative square root of two over two. So when I distribute the seven through, I should get J. And now on this problem down here, what is the exact value of tangent negative 11 pi over six if it exists? Well, one way you could do this is you could just come over the calculator and type that in. Um, it looks like here, if I just do this, I can just put it in the parentheses, 11 pi divided by six. And I wanna make sure I'm in radian mode. I am. And so, oh, that's a negative 11 pi, sorry. Negative 11 pi, I see that the answer is positive which when I look at my answers, I have two that are negative, and it's not undefined either, which means the answer has to be h. Let's check it. Make sure I did not do a typo. SQRT for square root. SQRT was what I typed in there. You divide that by three. Square root of three divided by three. The decimals do match, so we got it accurate. Okay, how would you do that if you were wanting to use the unit circle? 11, negative 11 pi over six means you go around negatively 11 pi over 6. So where is 11 pi over 6? It's right here. Notice it's the last line before 2 pi. So if you're going negative, it would be equivalent to 1 pi over 6. Negative 11 pi over 6 is periodic. Let's say this way, tangent of negative 11 pi over 6 will be equal to, because it's periodic, tangent being periodic, to the value of tangent of pi over 6. Now how did I know that? I just added 2 pi 
to it. So negative, but one pi, 11 pi over 6 positive would be this way. Negative 11 pi over 6 would be around this direction. And so you could be looking for the value here. And taking the tangent means you take your y and divide it by x. Because sine is y, cosine is x. Tangent is y divided by x. So I take my 1 and divide it by the square root of 3 for my solution. But we don't leave 3 in the denominator. So multiply top and bottom by square root of 3, which means basically the square root of 3 shoots up. And on the bottom, you remove the square root, and thus we get square root of 3 divided by 3.